Well, good evening, everyone. Amen. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. <laughs> this was when they said it was the graveyard session. I thought maybe uh, most people would be asleep. Good evening, everybody. Hey. And uh, congratulations to, to the team. Um, that have put together this amazing conference. I'm sure that someone, you know, that thinks they've done a good job might be able to find a way to put their hands together. Um, Soji, Yannick, you know, thank you so much for the amazing thing you've done and for having me here. Um, you know, they, they said graveyard session. I said, no, forget that. There is a palace that we use uh, in where I come from, or, you know, my part of town. Uh, they call it bottom pot. And bottom pot, they say, is the, is the bottom of the pot where, where all the ingredients have really severed from, from the top. And therefore, it's supposed to be the sweetest part of the session. But I recognize that I probably have less than 20 minutes or so to be able to quickly finish the bottom pot. Otherwise, some people are going to either be asleep or they'll be too hungry to listen. Right? But I, I think that it's been an amazing time just sitting down here listening to um, some of the, the panelists. I didn't get to see, hear much from the keynote speakers, but um, I just thought that the panelists that I listened to were absolutely brilliant. And I don't know if, you've, uh, if you came across any of those brilliant panelists. Would you like to appreciate them? <laughs> there, was one, well, there, there was one panelist in particular, and this is no particular uh, you know, prejudice to any, any of the other panelists, they were all brilliant, but there was one particular one that caught my eye. I mean, she was just absolutely beautiful to look at and delightsome to listen to. Um, so my eyes were fed, my brain was, and then my heart was busting. And, and I just didn't know what to do with her, only for me to find out that she was my wife. And my wife of, of 17 years today, and so if you don't mind, would you please not only appreciate the, the brilliant you know, performance that she put up on stage, but please just help me thank her for enduring me for 17 years. I put up a post this morning and I said, you know, um, thank you, she's my honey maker. She's the one that keeps the honey on the moon. And um, 17 years ago, uh, I decided to move onto the moon with you. We still haven't come back from honeymoon, baby. I'm love, I just love you so much, and I thank you. All right. So that was, that was 17 years ago. 47 years ago, on the other hand, it was a different story. Okay, so 17 years today, Tara and I got married. 47 years ago, it was a different story. I was tricked onto planet Earth um, on this very day. So I'm 47 years today. It's my birthday. Uh, and, 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 and before you applaud that particular incident, <laughs> I want to make it clear why I said I was tricked. Because my understanding of when, when the deal was consummated was that I was going to be born in Canada. My parents were lecturers at the University of Toronto. And then, you know, I, I thought that was a nice place to land until seven months or so into my mother's pregnancy, um, and apparently, from what I was told, my father had a dream. I'm not sure whether it was a dream or a nightmare. We need to be clear which one it is. But bottom line was that um, coming out of that, that dream, he said to my mom, we have to take him home. Now, they had not done any scan to know what the gender of the child was. They had had previously um, a son and a daughter. So there really shouldn't have been any other way that they should have known because, I mean, I have three boys, right? My wife once asked if I wanted to try for a girl. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any girls in me. Um, but the bottom line was my, my, my parents already had a boy and a girl. And so here it was, you know, I couldn't tell why, well, how come my father would know that this one was going to be a boy, but the decision was made to take me home. And so I said I was tricked because I was conceived in Toronto, Canada, and then I was received in Oluyole, Ibadan, <laughs> which for most people, you know, Ibadan is, a, is, a, is a city in the southwest part of Nigeria. But, you know, and I, and I told you that story to tell you this, that it's very interesting that most of us really, when you think about this whole concept of life, we, we realize that the key decisions that 
that affected our lives, nobody ever asked us about them. Nobody, did anybody ask you who you wanted to be born to? No, nobody asked me. Nobody asked me when I wanted to be born. Nobody even asked me where I wanted to be born. I'm sure if they had asked me, maybe we would have had a different conversation to the one that my father had in his dream. But the bottom line is that, that the key issues that pertain to your life many times are not things that you were involved with. You know, and I think even the bigger one is the why you had to be born. And there's a reason why I'm going on this route, because when I'm speaking to, to, the, to this crowd and having heard so many of the, of the wonderful things that you've heard, in the end, the one most important thing you're going to have to do is to ask yourself, so why did I have to go through that today? What was the whole point of, of this summit? I mean, this is, not, this is not the first summit you've ever been. I'm sure about that. And this probably won't be the last one you would have this year. So in the end, what, what's the bottom line? The bottom line would always be that one thing that you decide to do to answer the question why. Why was today worth it? Why did you have to be here? Because when you think about the whole concept of, you know, I, I talk about this thing about lifetime, it's the most descriptive word of itself. Life is time and time is life. And if you waste your time, you've committed suicide. If you waste somebody else's time, you've committed murder. I don't think any of the people that came here, the panelists and the organizers, wanted to murder what, a thousand, maybe 1,500 people. But the question is, what you decide to do with what you've heard today will determine whether you've literally just committed suicide or not. And this is a big issue. So for me, the theme scaling up impact is so big because it speaks to the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. And a lot of people say, look, fella, you know what? You, 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 you must have a lot of courage to, to step up into the game and run for the office of president. Some people have recommended that maybe I should have started just a little bit less, maybe Senate. Some people even said, no, maybe governor. Some people said, no, 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 maybe local government chairman. Some people said, no, 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 maybe ward councillor. Some people said, no, no, no. I said, ah. <laughs> but you know, the point is still wherever you wish to start, it's got to be a platform with which you intend to scale something hopefully that you're already doing. And this is the big idea. And I'll share a bit of that in the next few minutes that I have. Um, but it, it brings me back to this thing that I, that I really wanted to ask. The why are we here? You know, much of what it is that, that, that brought you into life, you were not involved with. Even the choice of where you would land, the family that you would land into, the kind of privilege that you would have access to. Some of you were born into wealthy families. Some of you were not born into wealthy families, but you were born into families that literally had to pull up their bootstrings, you know, and bootstraps and, and, and do all that it took, sell assets that they, your parents had acquired over many years to be able to get you here. Some of you came here on scholarships. And in a way, that itself is privilege. In a sense, what I'm saying is that most of you got here not just based on the strength of your hard work, but based on things that were prepared for you. Privilege. Privilege. But why? Why you? Why did you have that privilege? What was the privilege for? Why did you get the opportunity to come to London Business School or to any other school of that matter that had prepared you for where you are today? What is it about you that was better than anyone else that got you as far as you've gotten to? And, I, and to be honest with you, I, I hope that I'm not busting your bubble. Let me, be, let me just give you a very simple answer. Nada. You are not special because you were special. You are today given special opportunities because there was this concept that you could have been trusted not just with privilege, but also with the responsibility of privilege. And what is the responsibility of privilege? It's a very simple thing. It's an understanding that what I gained access to as a gift 
must become a gift to others who could not gain access to it. I'm going to say that again. The responsibility of privilege is to say that I have an understanding that what I gained access to as a gift must become a gift to those who could not gain access to it. In other words, those who carry the responsibility of privilege are not containers, they are channels. They understand that I have the privilege of receiving, but I have the obligation of releasing. That the knowledge that I have today, there are people who could not sit in the same class with the same professor. But there's nothing that says that I cannot take my notes and share them with some guy who has great interest and have conversations in the evening with someone who cannot afford to be at the London Business School. That is in part the most important thing while you're here is to understand that this was not an escape route from whatever the situation was at home. And home for many of you may not hear, there may not be, I mean, this is Africa club, so I, know, I should imagine that home for most of you is probably Africa. But I need you to please get this right. It's the ability to now take what it is that you have been lit by and understand that your job is to begin to light others. That knowledge is like light. And that the purpose of you being lit was not to shine. The purpose of you being lit was to brighten up your world, was to brighten up your countries, was to brighten up the continent. But that as a shining star, you you really can't achieve the greatest amount of, or the greatest impact of your purpose until you begin to scale up the impact that you have. And that impact, you're going to need to find a way to scale it up by transferring knowledge or taking it back home, transferring skill, transferring partnerships, relationships that you've built by privilege. Some of you have met people in this room You've had access to people that some of the guys at home will never have access to. Those people, you build relationships with them, but you still have an obligation to try and see how can I take those relationships back home. Those people will trust you, but there are people who need their help, but they will never get that trust. So you've got to be the bridge. And just before I just begin to wrap this up, I understand that this whole concept of go back home and Alexandra and Musu said, look, you know what, take this thing and take it back home. All you've learned and most of you are saying, eh, not so easy. <laughs> yeah, Alex, you're sitting down here and saying go back home. You know what it means to have to be the one that provides your own power, your own water, your own, your own security to have to provide. You know, do you know and understand? And, and Alex has been in the game, so yes, he does know what it means in one way or the other. He's faced his own challenges. And then there are incredible stories about people like Tara who have, against all odds, still been able to fly. And I like to say it this way, Africans were born with wings. It's just that over time, they've put cages over us. And if you can only find the kind of people who would lead us, not rule us, and take off the cages, we will fly. We don't even have to be taught how to fly because nobody teaches birds how to fly. So, so we've heard many of those amazing challenges in the course of either the uh, keynote speeches or, or the amazing presentations. You've heard challenges around infrastructure. Oh, infrastructure, infrastructure. I mean, you've heard challenges around distribution of products, of service. You've heard challenges about just, just the the platforms that will get you to be able to get money back and, and sometimes even how to just repatriate the investments that you've made. These are huge challenges. You've, you've heard about multiple layers of barriers to entry into the markets. Some of those are infrastructural barriers. Some of those are even ethical barriers. Alex told us an incredible story of some guys who tried to make it difficult for him once they heard that he was coming in. And, and you know, bottom line is, there are many things. Let's agree on one thing. It is not going to be easy to go back home to make an impact. But easy has no value. Think about it. 
Have you ever paid for something that was easy? How much do you pay for oxygen? When you can breathe easily. But you go and search for someone who's on, a, on, a, on a, an oxygenator or one of those life machines and you see how much people pay for tanks of oxygen. Because easy has no value. And the way to create impact and to create value is to look for the hard stuff. And don't be, don't, don't, don't be discouraged by whether it's easy or not. Understand that this is only a challenge. And no generation will be allowed to face a challenge that it was also not endued with the wisdom to solve. Meaning that whatever the challenges that you're facing or will, you could face back at home, you have what it takes to be able to solve those challenges. Otherwise, those challenges will not have been allowed in your time. But the most important thing you also need to understand is that what you have acquired is a higher level of thinking than the thinking that created the problems. And that is where your genius has to come to work. It's in providing solutions. So, so my point is to say there will always be opportunity in the things that are difficult. Don't run away from difficulty. Find solutions to it. And then don't just ride over it. Make it easy for other people. That is where the real impact is. But having said all of that, some of you are still going to say, well, you know what, fella, as long as it's tough, then I'm not going to do that. Because we all understand that the greatest challenge that we face is because if you have poor governance, no matter what kind of good you're trying to do, it will all end up in the basket. It's like water pouring water into the basket. I mean, I, many years ago, started a business in a, in a one-room room. And I, and, I, and I hope you got me right. I didn't say one-room apartment. I said a one-room room. It's a one room, four walls and one door. My mattress was on a carpet that had a hole in it. I didn't have a table, didn't have a, a laptop, didn't have a chair. My first staff resumed on a cane dustbin by the side of the door. My second staff was better treated. Uh, she sat down with me on the executive mattress. <laughs> And I, and I started business in 2001, um, at just about the same time that I got married. And, and, and I always used to think to myself, I met three crazy people that took a chance on me. I met my two staff that took a chance on me, and then I met this amazingly beautiful girl that took a chance on me. But the bottom line was, you know, one day I had asked her, I said, why, what, you, you, must have been, you must have been insane. I said, why, why did you take a chance on me? She said, look, you know, the thing about it was that every time you opened your mouth, you painted pictures that I had to be a part of. That's the power of vision. And vision sees things that may not seem obvious to others. And for me, I think that Niger Africa needs visionaries. And you guys are some of the visionaries that need to go into Africa because we need good governance. And, and today, most people are succeeding in business in spite of governance, not because of governance. We need to change that. And the only way we can change that, listen to this, guys, is to get involved. When our brightest and best minds get involved, we will make governance good. And I know most of you don't want to hear anything about that because they say, oh, politics is it's such a dirty game. To, to have good governance is not really a, such a tough concept. It's having good people in governance. When you say good people, you're talking about people who have the right level of of understanding, education, knowledge, skill, ability. All of that can deliver competence, but it takes more than competence for you to be a great leader. You need to have character because leadership usually would give you some dimensions of in immunity that if you don't have the right character, you will take that from immunity to impunity. So we need people who will not steal, not because they cannot be caught, but because it goes against their values. So we need not only people who are competent and people who have character, but we also need people who have compassion in their hearts, who feel the pain of others, who, who, who still feel pain when children beg for, for food on the streets or beg for handouts, trying to clean your, your glass. People must do more than what, try and flick them away like a, like a fly. We need people who truly have a heart for people. And many of those people are here in this room, most of you have compassion in your hearts. 
Most of you are carrying the best brains that Africa has to offer for our generation. Most of you have acquired incredible amounts of knowledge. Most of you are the perfect candidates to be the good people that must be found in governance. But the question is, how many of you are willing to go back home having paid 20,000 pounds to go and get a job in, just using Nigeria's example, in Nigeria Railway Corporation or Nigeria Water Corporation? How many of you know anybody who are, please, can I just see the hands of Nigerians? Anybody, just, because, just for this example, please, don't deny it, don't deny it, don't deny it. It's okay. <laughs> Let me see the hands of Nigerians all over the place. All right, fantastic. Now, please keep those hands up for a moment. How many of you know someone who works in Water Corporation? Who works in Water Corporation today? Not who worked, sorry, in Nigeria Water Corporation. <laughs> okay, so, so look at this now. If none of you even know someone who works in such a critical public service parastatal like Nigeria Water Corporation, who are the people that are there? Are they ghost workers? <laughs> Maybe they are actually. <laughs> so surprise, surprise that we don't have portable water coming out of our taps because our brightest and best minds are not found anywhere near there. Do you understand? We need to go into the public sector. We need to. Because much of the money that paid for your schooling came from Africa. That money has to come back as knowledge, skill, capacity, expertise to produce results in Africa. That's when we get return on our investment. Not just by sending money home, and we're grateful for the money you sent. But it's by coming home to create value. That is the greatest way to return. Think about it. Well, of course, then we need to have people in the political space. Because without the people in politics, you then wouldn't have the guys that will come out as elected officials and appointed officials who will shape public sector that will ultimately influence private sector. And this is where the big one is. Africa is ready. I'm going to say that again, Africa is ready. As I bring my thoughts to a close, I want you to remember this. Africa is not only ready for young, bright, smart guys who will come in and change the status quo. Africa is hungry for it. How do we know? Because I've gone in and I'm seeing, and you are seeing, for some of you who are following what is going on in Nigeria, the level of excitement that is going on. And people are getting involved. And there are people who today are getting involved and getting their, 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 their permanent voters cards and they're getting involved in running for office. And people you would never have seen in a, in a political party meeting are now beginning to go in and have meetings at ward levels. It is changing, guys. And you can be at the forefront of all of this. My wife is clapping. So I bring my thoughts to a close to say the greatest way that you can make a difference is to scale the impact of what it is that you're doing. A few years ago, we, we started just by a simple understanding, something really that happened to me. Some of you may have heard me talk about it. Something happened to me at, 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 at an at, right here in the United Kingdom, at Gatwick Airport on my way to the US. Some of you may have watched that video. But essentially what, what had happened was I was flying upper class, going to speak at a leadership conference, and just as I was about to board, I was put aside alongside a really distinguished couple, about 80, 70 years old. They could have looked like Nigeria's ambassador. I don't know, I mean, they just looked like distinguished. To cut the long story short, they put us aside, passed everybody else, in uh, priority boarding, and, and this lady then brought out uh, this thing that looked like a magnifying glass and started looking through my, my passport for, at my American visa, which I had used quite a few times. And to cut the very long story short, when she passed me back my passport, I refused to collect it. And I asked her, why did you do that? 
I mean, this is a passport that, that the US Customs and Immigrations had, had passed several times. And she said to me, please take no offense. We were told to do that for every Nigerian. And, and it occurred to me once I got back on the plane, and I, and I wrote this down and sent it as a tweet, I said, ordinary citizens of great nations will forever be treated better than successful citizens of failed states. And the second thing that I wrote, I said, individual success in the midst of collective failure will always be despised. And, and this is the point, guys. You can't outrun your identity. You, you can't outgrow it. The best thing you can do is to make sure that the countries that you are originally from are thriving. So you've got to be involved. And you've got to find ways to scale up your impact. And if you can do that, coming out of this conference, then it would have been a really great use of your lifetime. Because don't forget, your life is your time. And your time is your life. And I really want to say thank you so much for each one of you um, for giving me the opportunity to, to share these thoughts. So in conclusion, before I allow the man who was going to give a standing ovation, in conclusion, remember this is you. You are the lit match. You have been enlightened to enlighten others. You have been empowered to empower others. You have been blessed to be a blessing. You have been given privilege to make access for those without. And that is what will build great nations. God bless you. Thank you very much for having me. Let's talk about this decision of yours to run for office. So that means you're the guy that wakes up one day and says, hey, I'd like to run for office in a country where I have to deal with the fall in the price of oil, Boko Haram, I don't know what. I used to be a really successful guy and still am, but I want to take all these, on this, all these problems. Are you mad? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so so I, to I told you about how the guy who said to me, you know, I, I really salute your courage. And actually, that's probably one of the things I hear most often. I salute your courage, I salute your courage. And, and one guy said to me one day, but you know, it takes more than courage to do what you do. And I said, oh wow, tell me. He said, well, it takes a bit more, a bit of madness, and then a bit of insanity. And I, then I started thinking, ah, insanity and madness. He said, no, they are different. <laughs> but, you know, but then he then added up and he said also, and a bit of naivety. And I think that yes, it is true. It takes a little bit of all of those things. Um, but, but I definitely am mad. And why am I mad? I, 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 there was a leadership conference that I, that I ran about 10 years ago, and, and I asked, the, the theme of my, my message was, are you mad? And I said, only mad people can ever make a difference. And that, for me, was what mad is. And, and I had been, I, I cannot tell you where I got the compassion in my heart, because I think that compassion is a gift. It's also like privilege, right? It, it's given to you. You care about the things that you care about and you don't even know why you care. I mean, I've had situations where I would just drive along the street and, and I would, my wife knows I'll bust into tears. And she is like, look, what is it again? You know, and sometimes it's just the, just looking at all the things that, that frustrate me about the things that are not working and wondering why can't we make things work? We travel abroad, um, privilege. And all the time that I'm there, I'm like, so why can't we have this in Nigeria? So why can't this not be in Nigeria? So what is it? And she would say, please, can we just enjoy the holiday? Just can we attempt to enjoy a holiday? So actually, by the time that this clear understanding of what had to be done came, it was a relief for her. Because in a sense, she was, she was the person that was probably going mad with all of the, you know, my, my frustration and my despair and my, you know, this, you know, and, and she's been my greatest encourager, and I once again would ask you to please put your hands together. So, so I've, ha I've, I've had my greatest, I lead with my number one cheerleader. So uh, I'm here at, to hold you accountable. So I need to ask, Mr. Otoya, is this really what happened? <laughs> she says, absolutely, that's really what happened. Um, now, 
I described Nigeria as a, a country uh, facing a lot of challenges, but of course it's also Africa's biggest economy still, I believe, that surpassed South Africa, it didn't slip back. Um, and a, a wealthy country with a lot of opportunity as well. Um, having said that, one of the issues in terms of governance has been accountability and transparency for people in office. And so I wouldn't be doing my job and I wouldn't be a reporter for the Wall Street Journal if I didn't ask you to show me the money. Well, I think, look... How are you raising the, the funds for your campaign and will you be uh, publishing your assets so that people can see uh, where your interests lie? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, that's the first thing. Number two is... Uh, and this was, this was something that my wife and I had to, to sit down and ask. Now, don't forget, publishing assets is not required. Declaring your assets to the government is required. Publishing it is not. You can maybe get the government to, you, you know, through, through Freedom of Information Acts, you can access it, but willingly, freely, trying to publish it is not something that you have to do. Um, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you, we, we decided to do many things that for us um, were going to have to raise the bar and so that it makes it easier for people who really want to do the right thing and makes it more difficult for the people who want to do the wrong thing. And one of the things that we decided that we were going to do was to keep to the law according to donations, right? Um, so the law says that you really can't receive more than a million Naira donation as a candidate, as a, as an, as a candidate which really comes to what? To uh, 2,000 pounds, right? That's the maximum that any one person can give to you. And we made up our minds from the onset, we were not going to break the law. In part also because not, not only do we hold ourselves to very high ethical standards, we know that the rest of the Nigeria kind of like holds us to higher standards than anybody else. And we also understand that if, you know, those who want to get you, when they can't get you through, through any other means, they're gonna come with you at, uh, at you with the law. So. The first most important part of your question is, how are we funding this? We're funding this through crowdfunding and, and what you will think of as funding from friends and family, but not exceeding the amount that the law limits or caps. Um, and, and what we found to be more exciting was dimensions of funding that we, couldn't, we didn't realize were there. So because what we've been doing, and I've been telling everybody, this is not about Feladro today. This is about getting a generation in. And they've seen the work that we've done over the years. And they realized, look, this, this guy is for real. So people, for instance, are giving to us for free things that other people are paying millions for, or hundreds of thousands. So we go from place to place and have, have uh, meetings. Uh, and the rooms are given, to, the, the, the halls are given to us for free even hotel rooms, and people are saying, no, we believe in what you're doing, so please come and use this for free. Sound is given to us for free. People are printing backdrops for free. People are doing things. We've got volunteers. We've, there, are, there are people who are bringing their cars and buses, and things are being done for free. Most importantly, the one that blows my mind is just the amount of airtime we get. And airtime is extremely expensive in Nigeria. Those who have been there will know. And as I speak to you today, we have not paid for one newspaper posting. We have not paid for any radio station. We have not paid for any television station to go on. That, though, that's huge. But that's the kind of thing that you get when you're doing this for the right reason. So, so in the end, politics is not going to cost as much as most people think if you're doing it the nation builder's way. All right. We have a very good question from the, several good questions from the audience, and I'm going to take one here. Uh, what are the first three things you would do as president of Nigeria? Now, I'm going to hold you, your feet to the fire and, and get some specifics from you. Well, I, I think um, the first most important thing that anyone would ever do is get the right team together. Okay? Um, on the journey, you would have to have, as we would, uh, have shared your vision, all right? Um, and share the values by which you, hold to, you hope to be held accountable and by which you intend to also make sure that your, your team is held accountable. Um, and most importantly, you also have to have shared a roadmap that people believe in. My message has been so far, don't vote for anyone. Vote for the values or vote for the vision that they cast 
if it aligns with the kind of nation that you want your kids to grow in, vote for the values that they espouse or they emulate, um, uh, or, or that they role model, if they look like the kind of people you want your children to be like, and then vote for the roadmap that you believe will get you there. If you can do those three things, you're likely to get the, the right candidate. So on the journey, we will already have done that, okay? But the first most important thing that we need to do within the first 100 days is get a crack team of the people who have the right values, of the people who have the capacity to be able to take the best decisions and pull that team together. Once you are able to do that, the rest of it is going to be in line with your policy thrust. Now, on the 29th of May is when we are unveiling our policy thrust, right? Um, so I, we were talking about, should we give a taste, should we not, should we hold everybody in suspense until the 29th of May? What do you think? Well, okay. So, well, okay, so, so let me just say something. Um, the, the policy thrust is anchored around an acronym called INSPIRE, and it basically focuses on solving the problems that we have identified that our nation currently is going through. Some of them are clearly, you know, things that have to do with integration, national reorientation, security, power, infrastructure, restructuring the nation, as it were, and then, more importantly, education and creating an enab enabling environment for, for the people. Now, much of that is not something you can say, oh, this is the one I will do first. I'll solve power first. Because you need a nation that is even together for you to be able to, to solve power. You see where I'm coming from. So there are many of these things that you're going to have to do together. But the essence of every government is to secure the lives and property of its people, and more importantly, to be able to ensure that their lives, their standard of living, and more importantly, the quality of life is better. To do that, there are two ways. You try to do it for them, or you try to empower them to be able to do it for themselves. I am an advocate for empower the people and let them be able to help create the opportunities. So you've got to be able to create an enabling environment that helps people, but you've got to be able to also make sure that those people have the ability to help themselves because that's more sustainable than anything else. Got it. Um, I, I like this question that follows next. Um, and I'm going to add a little bit to it. Uh, the question is, what's your strategy to win to the 2020, 2019 election in a multi-ethnic Nigeria when the major political parties already zoned this to the north? And I'd like to add to that. You're against an, up against an incumbent with, I believe, nine presidential jets at his disposal. Uh, what's your real chances of Well, so let's, let's be clear. I mean, you can't fly. Even if you had 10 presidential jets, you still can't fly more than one, right? And it doesn't matter how you fly, whether it's by presidential jets or charter flight or whatever it is, the point is the people don't vote based on the number of jets you have. They vote on how far they can fly based on the vision that you cast for them and what they think that you'll be able to do for them. But, 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 but that's more than just a sound bite. It is the truth that across Nigeria, people want the same thing. They want a better quality of life. They want, they want to be secure. And they don't want to be the ones that have to be their own government to be able to live a half good life. You know, you don't want power because you can own a generator. You don't want water because you own a borehole. You don't want to be secure because you have three or four dogs as well as, uh, you know, security guards. That's not where you get a sense of security from. And so what the people want is the same. And once people understand that the same problem leads to everything that they have not had, poor governance. And the only reason why they have poor governance is that the current system is designed to produce rulers, not leaders. In other words, the current system is designed by people who hold power to ensure that real bright guys who want to be able to make life better for everybody else never get the opportunity to do so. Because there's, there's a problem that, that that creates for the power brokers. If I have power and, and you become so effective in, in governance, the people will fall in love with you. If they fall in love with you, then I lose my power. And so they don't want that. So most of the time, the, and you know, we don't really have much of a democracy. We have something called selectocracy, which is the capacity for people to select who has the opportunity to run for office. 
which amongst the aspirants will become candidates. And so the bottom line is this, right? Is that we've got to be able to find a way to change that system. And the only way you can do that is to have what you call internal democracy, which means that you're gonna have a system where it is the members of the party that actually get the right to vote at the primaries of the, you know, the, 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 the primaries. Currently, that doesn't happen across most of the established parties. It is delegates that are owned by the godfathers and the power brokers that usually determine who gets to become candidate. So what we are doing is we're changing that. Now, luckily, as it were, um, there is a party that I discovered. I didn't, I didn't start the party, but it's called Alliance for New Nigeria. And the only reason why I chose that party, I have maybe above five or six other parties that approached me to be their presidential candidate, was because Alliance for New Nigeria said to me, we cannot guarantee that you will become the candidate. Um, we are only going to offer you a free and fair platform. And that was what was most special to me. The other ones were guaranteeing my candidacy. And I said to them, if you can make me a, your presidential candidate, you can make a thief a gubernatorial candidate. You can make a thief a senator. So we give us, the, give the people the power. And once you give the people the power, they will be able to now, of course, it is who pays the piper that dictates the, cue, the tune, right? So, so if they are the ones who give you their votes and they are the ones that give you their money, then you have to go meet the people and share their vision with them. And your allegiance is to the people. But if it is the power brokers that paid you and the power brokers that selected you, then your allegiance is to the power brokers. So the only way we can break this thing is exactly the way we're going about it. Take the power and give it back to the people. It is only the power that belongs, that is in the hands of the people that does not corrupt. Power in the hands of a privileged few makes them powerful. And what I mean by powerful is not just P-O-W-E-R-F-U-L, it's P-O-W-E-R-F-O-O-L. <laughs> On that note, let's talk about Congress. Um, it's a very progressive body, but in the late years, it's also a body that has been gridlocked in terms of passing legislation. Um, there is a presidential candidate who has suggested that maybe the Senate needs to be abolished uh, in order to get past that gridlock. Um, what are some of your suggestions in order to, to get a, a legislative body that's really working as you, as you talk about for the people? Well, my suggestions are the ones that I have been conversing for the last few years, especially in the last few months. We need to get our brightest and best guys running for, for legislative office, for Senate, for House of Representatives, for state houses of assembly. And, and more importantly, we need to get them to run in a way together, even if they're running on different party platforms, which means that they have to have the ability to tie their agenda to one mainstream agenda. And so when you hear me say things like we're running for a new Nigeria, right, um, for those who have been following us, that's exactly what we're encouraging other people to do. So you hear people saying, my name is, you know, and I'm running as I'm running for a new Nigeria on the platform of gubernatorial candidate for Imo State. Um, and we're now seeing the emergence of this, you know, some of these brightest people. And some of them are coming back home and running for the first time. And the whole idea is behind this is to say we need, a, we need a collection, a critical mass of good people, fresh guys, fresh minds, who will be, you know, tied by one one mainstream idea, like Inspire, and those guys are going to be able to run for office, and that's how we're going to, we, we've got to do this almost like the way Donald Trump spoke about it, but we can do it. And this is literally to drain the swamp. And, and we're hoping that with the level of discontent, uh, despair, anger, um, that the young people are, are facing, and, and the, the level of hope that they have by seeing a new generation emerge, that we would be able to actually get on, in February 2019, we'll get a clean sweep across the, not just elective officials, or offices, but the legislators too. I, I don't think we need to scrap, scrap the, the, the legislature. I think that we need to reduce the, their salaries. And so those of them that are running for a new Nigeria are signing up to stuff like that. They're saying, we, we, if you get us in there, 
we will reduce our salaries by this amount and we're going to peg those salaries to GDP, which is what most of the other countries that do great things do. They, they say we will earn a portion of our salaries as GDP. Um, you know, we would, and there are many of the pure wastages that, that go on, you know, in, in, in the legislative sector that we would find ways to cut, you know, so. We talked a little bit of in the beginning about how you basically raised your hand to try to solve some problems that no one else has been able to properly solve. One of, the, one of these problems is, of course, the security issue in Nigeria. Um, some have criticized the, the current administration for negotiating with hostage takers, um, for providing them with funds in exchange for the release of, of hostages. I know this is a difficult one, but would you ever negotiate with hostage takers? And how, in general, are you going to address the security issue in Nigeria? Look, I, again, for sound bites, there are many things that, that are easier said than, than done when you face real life issues of having to deal with what do you have to do in principle, in principle, it should never be done. You should never have to negotiate with hostage takers, right? Well, that's in principle. Some people are gonna to say to you that in practice, all over the world, things have had to happen that you did not in intend, um, that there are also sometimes when there, there are negotiations will take place to one level to be able to get some dimension of insight that can enable you to do certain things. I cannot tell you, to be honest, I think that the first most, most important thing as it relates to security is making sure you have the brightest and best people taking the decisions that, that will affect the security and the lives of property, um, uh, lives and property of the people. But I think it's a big shame that in spite of all the loss of lives and property that we've had, no one has lost their job in Nigeria. We haven't had anyone, whether it's the Inspector General of Police, the Minister of Defense, Chief of Army Staff, the people who are given the responsibility to secure the lives and property of, the, of Nigerians have not been held accountable in spite of what is an obvious failure of what, what we've seen and in this administration. So I think that the first most important thing is get the right people there, and there are more other levels of things. Uh, some of you might even find some of, something I posted on Instagram a little while ago about the seven key areas of security you're gonna have to deal with or to get a, a highly effective and honorable um, security forces going. But the most important thing is get the right people there and hold them accountable. If people die as it is possible that can happen, right? Somebody's going to have to be held responsible. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to just ask one brief question um, and get a brief answer to this. It's a very good one from the audience. You represent a new dawn as the first uh, technocrat president, but how do you plan to connect with illiterates or semi-illiterates who typically don't connect with this type of candidacy? Okay, so first of all, I, again, uh, I, I always say to people, somebody said to me one day, you know, fella, you dress too well to connect with the grassroots. And I said, well, that can't be true. In fact, what I've heard every time I've gone, and, and, and we do have a structure that takes us deep into the grassroots. And if anybody also goes on my Instagram page, you'll see, for instance, um, my, my post yesterday or day before yesterday was actually sharing one of those, those moments that, that we were talking to people. And I said, one thing I found out all the time is people actually say to me all the time, especially when you get to the grassroots, are you going to be able to help one day for my children to be, like, to be like you? And that is very special. In other words, the people who look at you see what they hope their children will become. What you've got to do is to be able to find a way to get that message across to them and from the bottom of your heart try and make those opportunities available to them. But they all want the same thing. They want clean water, they want safe houses, they want clean houses, they want clean health, uh, you know, health care, they want, they want to be able to go from place to place and, and not have to spend hours on, on roads that they should spend minutes on. People want the same thing, you know, and so we need to go in there. But the beautiful thing about running for a new Nigeria, which means not running by yourself, but running with a generation of people who are up running at different levels, is that, so imagine that there is, for lack of a better example, please forgive me if it does, hope that you don't find this offensive, a market woman, right? That one market woman has four 
constituent is a constituent member of four elected offices. So she's the guy who's running for House of Assembly has her within his constituency or her constituency. The guy who's running or the lady who's running for governor has also. The person who's running for, for House of Representatives are on Congress, and then the person running for, for Senate. Those are four layers of people. Imagine if all of those people were saying the same thing, but they would speak in her language, even if Fela doesn't understand her language. So there is the power of translation, which can be done, but more importantly, the people who are closest to her would also understand what it is. They would speak her language, and they would speak it all across Nigeria. So if Fela was running by himself, he may not be able to get the message across as effectively as possible. But if Fela is running with a team of people, if Fela is running with a generation of people who are all people who are capable, who have a true compassion in their heart, who are close enough to each, each and every single person, then we'll be able to get the message across. All right. On that note, thank you so very much for being here and talking and sharing with us. Thank you.